ahead. Okay. Shall we kick this off? <clears throat> well, hello, ladies and gents. Our beloved listeners, even though at this point, I feel like you guys are beyond just your average listeners. What are you? You are family now. You're our besties. And um, yeah, I think, uh, I think we wanted to jump in today with a little introduction to the space we're coming from, like we normally do with all our episodes. So what, we're talking about our back context, what was generally going on now? No, I want to I wanna give you guys a pretense on the topic and the energy of this <sighs> episode. That's what I meant by that. Okay. So if you guys tuned in to the last one, well, you know that Marissa and I were just letting... It was a really cheerful one, right? Yeah. It was like a good like catch-up. We were kind of taking catch up over wine. Taking our power back. Yeah. It was all about empowerment, feeling good about ourselves, feeling good in our own skin. And now we're going to go the opposite way and be like, what's it like when you're not good in your own skin? And so today's topic is a lot heavier. We actually haven't done a heavy topic in a while, Mm -hmm. Um, but I do think this one is actually really long overdue. We're going to be talking about my personal history with an eating disorder um, and everything that I went through. And it's kind of more in the hopes that there's someone out there listening who maybe just needs a bit of support or guidance or feeling like they're not alone um, because a lot of women go through this a lot of men go through this and I think it's just for all we celebrate in terms of our confidence and owning who we are I think people need to know that it wasn't always the case and that it was a long road to get here as well very very well said so before we go further I think it's only fair and very responsible to give a trigger warning that this episode contains topics of well, mental health, eating self-harm, disorders, eating disorders. Yeah. And um, yeah, so if any of that already gives any sort of uh, inkling to you that maybe this is not for you, well, honey boo boo, we will see you in the next episode. But for those of you who are intrigued to stick around, let's begin. So mm. I think it's also for me, it's really interesting on how I want to approach this with you because it's something that I've known about you for a long time, but I've also known that that your journey to sharing this side of your story is completely yours. So it's almost like, okay, I'm here to be supportive and guide you through it. But at the same time, it's like, this is such a big part of you. Where do we even begin? I think it's also because we've been friends for a really long time. And when it was at its peak was when we didn't live in the same city. So you didn't actually see it head on. And so you kind of were there before it all kicked off and then you were sort of there after it all ended. And we but, never really spoke about it. But also, I mean, a little background, like we weren't close in high school. No, we, we were weren't. friends. But we like were like, like class cl- buddies. Classmates, yeah. yeah, same year. And then when she went off to university, it was just like different lives as you do. And we only really, really got close when we both came back and like were in our early 20s and started working. And yeah. that sort of like young adulthood had, we were kind of, exiting that era of our lives so I didn't I only knew through what you told me yeah after I had no idea how crazy it got yeah and I didn't I mean frankly I didn't even tell that many people there were the people who saw it unfold and there was my family who were there to support me but then in terms of it being this story I told at a dinner table it wasn't really like conversation it was it was kind of something that I could mention in passing and be like yeah you know I used to suffer from that or I used to I've bonded with a few people through the understanding that they went through it too but it was never something that I opened up about it was not a story I've ever really told Mm -hmm. and I kind of feel like I wish there was someone who told their story when I was going through it. Mm -hmm. And so I kind of hope that it helps somebody. If it helps one person, that's enough. So then let's start with the story. Let's give the people an age group. Where were you in your life when you started having, what's the right term? Suffer? (sighs) When the symptoms started to show. The symptoms started to show, yeah. The problematic behavior started to show. Um, I was around 19. It was my second year of university, so I had moved into an apartment with some friends. Um, and I don't honestly know what it was, but I know... Th- so the summer before, my grandmother had died, and a lot of literature, therapy, speaking to my family would suggest that it was probably kind of uh, an unhealthy coping mechanism. Like, like a, a response to grief. Yeah, like, yeah. A, a, re- a, like a negative reaction to mm-hmm. it. Because basically after my grandmother died, my brain sort of clicked and went, 
you need to focus on what you're doing with your life. Like you need to be more disciplined. You need to have more control and you need to get your shit together. And one of those things was I was always very self-conscious about my body as all teen girls were, right? Like I was athletic in high school. I was always very physically fit, but I was always the one on Tumblr wondering why all these girls had a thigh gap and I didn't. Mm. And like, mm -hmm. we all know that feeling, right? But oh, then- And I also remember that era big time, yeah. that like MySpace era when like all the skinny girls were just so skinny. And there was also, there wasn't enough policing on the internet. So like all of these like um, pro uh, eating disorder groups were really rampant. So you had like the pro Anna groups. Yeah. And what was the other one for bulimia? I don't know. They had a nickname for her. Yeah. But there would be these like Tumblr groups and MySpace groups glorifying eating disorders. And it was huge, but it was so under the radar that if you were not a parent or an adult, you wouldn't even know what was going on. Yeah, so now if you're on Instagram, I feel like there's enough counterculture that if you kind of go down that route, there's enough material to correct your trajectory. Mm -hmm. But there wasn't that when I was browsing the internet at, you know, 17, 18. And I would always see these women and be like, well, if I'm so fit and healthy, how come I don't look like that? Mm, oh, and I know exactly what kind of woman you're t thinking of. You're thinking mm -hmm. of little Jay from Gossip Girl. Exactly. Right? She was She was one of the she, people. No, she really was. Like with her big raccoon eyeliner and her like big ass, like grungy MySpace hair, just leaning over into the camera with that like skinny skeletal thigh gap that was so glorified. Yeah. yeah. And, and I think a lot of girls, it's a really negative influence. And I think a lot of girls see that and they do internalize it in terms of the body standards they hold themselves to. But fortunately, not everyone falls over the cliff edge into the disordered view of it, which is obviously what affected me. Uh, so then basically going back to where I was in university and having gone through the grief and having gone through this mindset shift of being like, you need control mm -hmm. and everything is about discipline. And I had gained a lot of weight in my first year of university because I was having a good time. I wasn't working out anymore. And my body changed as it should have. Yeah. And also one of the most common things when you enter university is that your, your yeah. body changes because yeah. you're just, you're having your time. You're having a good time, but also you're like, you're, you're, it's your first life like outside of the nest. So you need to like cook for yourself. You need to like feed yourself. Yeah. And yeah. It, it's a big wake up call to how lucky we were that our parents <laughs> took care of that for us. Yeah. No, exactly. And I, I didn't like the body change. And if I'm being really blunt about it, I was by no means overweight. I was still very much a healthy body. But in my mind, I was like, you're huge. Mm. And I started to see that in the mirror. And I used to like pinch parts of my body and be like, this is because you lack discipline. Mm. And so I started to fixate and I started to exercise rigorously. I started to control what I would eat. And then I don't know, I don't know the precise day in which it went from just this unhealthy habit to a psychological problem. But I do remember the day I did realize it was a problem. And it was because, I mean, I studied psychology in university and we did a module on disordered behaviors and abnormal behaviors. And then there was a slide about disordered eating and it was, I ticked every single mm. box. And I remember coming home to my apartment and then no one was in and I just sat and cried because I realized that what I thought was about discipline and control had started to control me instead. Mm. And I didn't know what to do about it. But yeah, that was rough timeline. Oh, wait, I need to pause there. <laughs> <laughs> Who cares about you? Like, fuck. So you're 19. Yeah. You've waken up to the self-awareness that, oh my God, what I thought was for my own benefit is now tipped over and now I'm actually harming myself. Yeah. And you're away from your family. You're living outside of the nest for the first time. I mean, that sounds like a really dark place to be in, but like after you woke up to that, how long did you stay in that space? Like how long did you know? And like, did, and, and did you tell people around you? Did you reach out for help or like, how did you process it? I knew I could trust my parents to tell them that there was a problem. And I remembered a Skype call and telling my parents that I was realizing that I was dropping weight and I, it was at an alarming rate and I didn't know what to do about it. And all the suggestions of just eating more weren't working because I was terrified to eat. Mm. Um, and I remembered my mom 
looking at me and asking me to raise my arms so she could see how thin I had gotten. And then she just started yelling. And so it freaked me out and I didn't know mm. because my mom didn't understand what it was. So yeah. she got upset and she got angry and my dad was obviously confused and he wasn't sure what to do. But eventually they, you know, they did a bit of research and they started to come around to it, but it took them a long time. And then on the friendship side, I told nobody. Mm. I didn't tell a single soul. Um, people obviously made assumptions based on the fact that I was disappearing in front of their eyes but it wasn't met with support. It wasn't really met with, are you okay? It was, it was mean girl shit. Like I would get comments on my Facebook photos just saying eat. And really? I, would, I would have girls laughing if they would watch me at a meal. And so I got so cripplingly socially anxious that I stopped going out. I stopped seeing anyone. Um, I'm sorry, but who, who, was, who the hell would go on comment on someone's photo when they're clearly suffering with a comment like, eat? Jesus. I'm sorry. People are such assholes. But this was the thing, that back at that point in time, so this is what, 2011, 2012, people didn't understand eating disorders the way that they understand them now. Yeah. And so it was very much this, oh, it's just another girl thing, like girls just trying to get skinny. And the thing is that a lot of the narrative around eating disorders is that, oh, you're preoccupied with losing weight, but that's actually not sympt like symptomatically that's what's happening, but psychologically that's not what's going on at all. Mm. Um, so Did you have um, body dysmorphia? Yeah. So when you looked in the mirror, you couldn't see what other people saw? Yes and no. Um, I knew I was skinny. And I, I could see parts of my body in ways that like I knew wasn't healthy anymore. But then I would still say I had a big meal. Mm -hmm. I would see myself physically get bigger. It wasn't just the stomach bloat. I'd be like, oh, see, now my thighs are fractionally closer together now. Or really? like, yeah, it would, it, you know, on some level, there was a level of awareness that I was unhealthily thin. Um, but there was also this, yeah, but if I just gain a fraction of weight, then I've gone too far. Mm. So you kind of get stuck in this like twilight zone of not being able to go either direction. You don't want to lose more, but you're terrified to gain more too. Yeah. Yeah. Oh man. Okay. So how long were you away from home with this eating disorder until someone close to you came in or was it you that came in for yourself? Uh, I went home for Christmas yeah. that year um, and my parents sat me down and said, if you want to drop out of university and give yourself a year to recover, we're more than willing to do that. Mm -hmm. And so they were very much there as a supportive force uh, and they were very much there to encourage me to eat more and like celebrate when I did eat. What was that like? I understood the benefit of it, but I hated every second of it. Yeah, I mean, I can only imagine because it's such a complex relationship you have with food and eating that to have like a celebratory energy around it could, I, I mean, I'd imagine it would feel like, I don't know, like, yeah, extremely frustrating. Yeah, because yeah. suddenly all you are in people's eyes is the person that needs to eat. Mm. And... I lost every other sense of like self-worth or who I was because I was just my illness at that point in time. Mm. And I understood the benefit that they were trying to bring. They were offering a lot of help. You know, do I want to see a psychologist? Did I want to see, you know, even just a, a general doctor? Um, and I refused all of it because stupidly in my mind, if I was to accept external help and if I was to drop out of university, that that meant that I had failed and that right. I was too weak to overcome. Right. And looking back, I'm very glad that I didn't quit university because I think that was actually instrumental in my recovery in the end. But I wish I accepted help in the way that, mm. like I still have that thing now where I think about like how resistant I was just to the idea of help because it was supposed to be something I fixed myself, which is, not true which is so i mean it's it's like the common theme i see i know with you exactly where it's yeah. like you hold yourself up to a really high standard and then that like overachiever perfectionist and all this really yeah. kicks in because it's like the thing that triggered the beginning of your eating disorder journey was this ideal that you could you should be doing better for yourself yeah. you should be maximizing your time and be the best at what you can it was that like like that heavy ass pressure to do well massively yeah yeah it's the thing that started 
your eating disorder and it's also the thing that stopped you from getting help from your eating disorder yeah because it was all on your shoulders that you needed to do this for yourself you need to fix yourself because even at your low you need to help yourself yeah you need to save yourself exactly and i think the journey would have been so different had i just been like yeah i need help but at the same time it wouldn't have been my way of doing it. Yeah. Like it wouldn't be me. It wouldn't be a Marissa recovery, yeah. which was a twisted narrative. Like I was locking myself into a narrative that I had set for myself. No one else was applying that pressure except me. And I refused to budge. Mm. Absolutely refused. I remembered my dad actually gave me um, one anti-anxiety pill and said, you know, like if it gets really, really bad, just take this, it'll curve the edge off and you'll just, it'll help you relax ever so slightly. And I held it to this, like I made it this like big symbol of like this nuclear option. Mm. And years later, I actually found that pill in one of my toiletry bags because I refused to take it because it became this like, if you take that, then you admit defeat. You you failed. And that was such a, yeah. it was so twisted and it was so unnecessary. Yeah. But that was the headspace I was in. Oh my God. Okay. So... I'm doing this chronologically. Right. <laughs> yeah, this let's, is this is this let's is, go timeline. This is the timeline. Okay, so we're coming back to the story. Your headspace. Your your. You came back for that Christmas. Did you did you regress when you after you left your your family home? Because in a way, in the comfort of your family zone, right? Like your support was there. Yeah. So if you'd left, it's very easy for people with a mental illness to fall back without that support yeah. did that happen to you yeah yeah mainly because and also was it what how was it different like this I guess second time around being away from your family because the first time is when it developed and then you went back into and I guess recovery mode I say that loosely mm. um and then you go back and it's almost like this time you've like the self-awareness is too high. Like you know too much of what you're actually going through. So what was it like to experience that while all the same time knowing quite plainly, like black and white, you mm. know, you knew what was happening to you. I think that's the thing though, that I only knew I had a problem, but we hadn't started to fix it yet. So on that family holiday, it was good and everything was great, but I was still mentally completely fixated on what I was eating and what I was putting in my body. So it's almost like, would you say you knew you had a problem, but you were not at the point for yourself where you wanted to fix the problem? Would you say you were ready to heal? No, I don't think I was ready to yeah. heal. Um, like practically speaking, I wanted my headspace to end because mm -hmm. every day was exhausting and every day I hated how much of a hurdle it was just to get through. And like, I could not stop thinking about what I had eaten, what I was going to eat, how little I could eat, how much more I could eat, like the allowance I would give myself. It's like consuming. Oh, it was completely consuming. Yeah. Like you're obsessed. And um, so over that holiday, I did regain a little bit of weight just by being home and, and then, you know, there being food I wanted to eat, but I had it in my mind that it's okay you can correct your weight when you get mm. back. Like once you're away from your support network, you can go right back to where you were yeah. and keep punishing yourself. Jesus, that's so you. I'm sorry, <laughs> but it's like, watch me go hard. <laughs> it's it's Damn, because girl. I think a lot of people, when they think about eating disorders is they just think about it as like, you just eating to get as skinny as possible. But that's not actually what is happening, at least not for everyone and at least not for me. It was... It was more a self-punishment, like a self-harm. So everything was geared towards, I wasn't trying to lose weight. I had already lost a, an, an astonishing amount of weight. Like I think back to the numbers and I'm genuinely a little bit surprised that I could have gone that far. But it was this idea of trying to find this balance of how little can you eat that you can survive, mm -hmm. but know that you're still at your bare minimum versus how much, people you're, how much people expect you to eat. And then, so for me, it was, I, wouldn't, I would eat so little that I would wake up in the night starving. 
and I would have to have a small snack to put me back to sleep. And that was probably largely where my insomnia stems from. Mm. And if I would sleep a full night, that meant that I had gone overboard because I had slept so well that my body was able to rest. Mm. That meant that I had exceeded what I should have eaten and I needed to cut back again. Damn, so if you'd wake up from a proper night's sleep, you would wake up feeling like, damn it. I failed. I failed. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So the second time round, coming back to the timeline, you are back in uni. Um, how long did that last for? And then like, at what point in your um, degree was this? Because did you go through the rest of your like university experience with an eating disorder? Yeah, I did. So how like how many like years? Two years? One year? I would say I had physically recovered weight wise around twenty five, twenty six years old. And you had started at nineteen. Yeah. Wow. Mentally. I would say I'm probably still recovering. Of course. Um, yeah, of course. Because, because no, but also, I mean, it's also the recognition that what you went through is a mental illness. And like yeah. the timeline of recovery when it comes to our mind and our soul and our spirit, like there is no like predictable timeline of when you will be able to bounce back. For all you know, and touch wood truly, but this could, this is something that could come up yeah. for maybe the rest of your life. I think one of the biggest misconceptions around this disease or this illness is that the once you fix the weight, you fix the problem. Mm -hmm. And physiologically speaking, you do. Because once you hit a certain weight, you are practically dying. Mm -hmm. Like you, your body is struggling to survive. And it's actually genuinely consuming itself. Mm -hmm. because it has nothing else to take in. So your body's wasting away. And so when you kick up the weight, then you at least put that person in a better position to start addressing the psychological side of things. But then it's a double-edged sword because if you're getting someone to gain weight before they're prepared to mentally and emotionally and psychologically, they're going to hate every single part of that process and they're, going to men and they're just going to fixate on the moment someone looks away, I'm going to go right back to where I should be because you're not, fixing the root of the problem. Yeah. And that's what's horrifying about yeah. it. Yeah. So, I mean, okay, I mean, it just like, even for me, just like understanding how long you went through that with, this whole cycle of like recovery and then back to your own, I don't know what the word is, devices, <laughs> right? Like yeah. going in, in and out of your support network to moments by yourself where... Yeah it was almost like you'd be flipping. You'd be going, okay, I'm eating and I'm doing good and I'm on the mend. And then the moment you'd leave that nest, you'd be like, okay, let me make up for, for what mm. I just did. That went on for wait, 19, so six years. Yeah. About six years. But, but I want to lead up to the question now. So you went through university with this. Mm -hmm. um, uh, then you came back to Singapore, started your work life. Mm -hmm. At what point, because this is my understanding, with people who suffer with mental illnesses and disorders is that in order to really start the true recovery, there is a, um, what's the word? Rock bottom. Yeah. There is a moment where all you can do right now is, is like, is go up because you're so low. Mm -hmm. What ha When was that for you? It's also like that moment, I guess, when you find your why, right? Yeah. Um, I think there were a few rock bottoms. I think also in terms of, it wasn't like I was on the recovery and then I was relapsing. It was more of this yo-yo effect of trying to take the recovery that I did get from being home and try hold on to it as long as possible without falling back into destructive habits. But then I would sometimes slip back into it. Um, yeah, there were there were a few rock bottoms but one that's like I mentioned one which is when I saw all of my symptoms on a slide and mm. realized that it was a problem um I I would say there was one moment where I actually thought I was doing better um because I loved food so much my parents have always talked to me about like 
even as a child, I was always with a snack in hand because I just, I was so passionate about food. And we went to Ireland and it's one of like, we were in this area that's one of the culinary paradises of fresh seafood and everything that I love about food. And I was so excited to be there. And then there was just a moment, sorry, I'm gonna cry. <laughs> it's okay. There was a, there was a lunch. Um, just give me a second. Yeah. I've genuinely forgotten this moment till now. <laughs> okay. Yeah. There was a lunch that uh, was delicious and I, I loved it, but then there was just this leftover bowl of mashed potato. And my mum said, finish the potato. Mm. And I remembered staring at him being like, well, I can't. And she said, well, yes, you can. It's just potatoes. And I just remembered looking at it and being like, it's like, I just filled with panic over a bowl of potatoes. Mm. And I, and I remembered forcing myself to eat it, crying through it. And then just not being able to face anyone for the rest of the day, because I knew how irrational it was that I was crying over just this small little thing, but how much it was breaking me to be able to have to do it mm. and realizing how out of control this had gotten and how even though we were like two, three years into it where I was like, oh, after a couple of years, surely you're healing by now. I wasn't, I wasn't even close. And I remember thinking like, I don't know what has to change, but I can't live like this anymore. Mm. And I don't, I didn't know what to do mm. because at the same time, the other narrative was still, I don't want to gain. I don't want to like put weight back on. And I think again, like people preoccupy themselves with this skinniness, but it wasn't that it was, you are so obsessed with keeping this under control because if you lose that control, even for a fraction, you're so filled with dread and panic and it's almost like the world's going to end. Mm. And it's not because you think, oh, the world's going to end if I'm bigger. It's I th like you feel like something is about to go wrong. Mm -hmm. That's where the obsession compulsion comes mm -hmm. into it. Yeah, I mean... I'm sorry that story was brought up. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm glad we're talking about yeah. it, frankly. Because it, it goes to show you like how far it can go. Yeah. And I've spoken to other girlfriends who have been through this experience. And I think all of us have our like mashed potato yeah. moment. Yeah. Where you I realize. I think it's like really interesting because how you're emphasizing that it, it's not about looks. It's totally not about no. like superficial like thigh gap and everything. It's 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 the control element because the thing about control that a lot of us overlook I feel is that control for a lot of people looks like safety yeah it when was. I'm in control I'm safe 100% because I I know what I'm doing and and yeah and and that's why I think like we misunderstand a, a disorder like this and we blame it on the beauty magazines, mm -hmm. we blame it on that. And sure, yes, these are trigger points and definitely they have a lot of weight in this conversation. But this idea of having to have such an incessant need of control in order for you to just operate in the world to feel safe. Yeah. Is, is so crazy. It was about safety. Yeah. It really was. It was about emotional safety and knowing where things were, like circumstances were under my control and therefore I had say over the outcome of things because it, it wasn't about looks like I, it wasn't it wasn't because obviously those control behaviors the obsession and the compulsiveness manifested through my preoccupation with my weight and exercise and what I was eating but it was also I mean if I think about it there was this validating aspect to it. Mm. Like on the one hand, I'm looking in the mirror and I'm seeing all of my bones and I'm seeing my body literally develop a thin layer of hair because I had such low body fat that my body had to grow hair to keep itself warm. I would walk in Singapore with sweaters on because I was freezing mm. in Singapore. Mm. And at the same time, on the beauty side of things, I was being praised for how I looked. Mm. I was booking modeling jobs. I was on a runway. I was doing photo shoots. I was getting like casting calls. I was 
being told however you look now society values that yeah and so it polluted this idea of recovery because it was like well my value now is here they've told me that it's here and when you're in a position where you don't have any sense of value or self-worth anywhere else you will put all of your attachment and energy into where someone's willing to give it to you and that's where it was. Oh, girl, trust me. I know that story big time. <laughs> oh, my God. The shit that I've seen in my time working in showbiz, like the amount of girls who would fall victim to this disorder that was just like, it was so fucked up how normal it was. Like, Jesus, mm-hmm. guys. I remember I was... Um, I would always walk in Singapore Fashion Week back then, and you would see girls, like, just exhausted, like, bent over, exhausted, so tired. And normally at the back of these fashion shows, they feed the models, right? Mm -hmm. And, like, most of us would eat. But then there would always be this handful that don't eat. And I remember the saddest thing that I remember seeing was this girl who was just so weak, clearly, and she was snacking on iceberg lettuce, Mm -hmm. she was just like tearing off like the leaves of iceberg lettuce like fresh from the little plastic bag from the supermarket basically and being like no this is dinner yeah and it's just yeah and and it's so fucked up how society works that way and to a degree i mean would i say that we've improved yes we've improved on the wokeness element of it but now we have so many different angles to hit women with on their looks. Like, I think before it was like, okay, skinny, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, now, now it's, it's oh, like, like, do you need ass implants? Yes. Do you need lip filler? Do you need, yeah, like, what yeah. else do you need it's, to doctor your body And in, in a way, way, because of social media, that double-edged sword, it's like, okay, we have awareness around it, but now we also have more exposure to the things that can trigger this. Like, yeah. And also just, like, the complete, like, lie that is photoshop facetune filters and everything we've like we're i don't know it's it's two-sided like yes we are more conscious of it but then there's also so much more shit that we need to be conscious of yeah exactly like we're having the conversation as more weapons are being brought up against us and you're just like well at some point because i mean the thing is that exactly like as you attach all of your value to that recovery means losing that validation Mm. and so if i like as i gained weight i stopped getting offers for jobs Mm -hmm. and i had to reconcile that that was no longer where i held value Mm -hmm. and it did make me feel like the the healthier i am the less beautiful i am because Mm. i am no longer celebrated for my body nor my looks Mm. and In a twisted silver lining, it meant that I devoted a lot more of my energy to other areas of my life that I take pride in. But at that, but when you're in that recovery spot, like how are you supposed to tell someone in their early twenties that they're not going to be counted as beautiful by society in terms of media if they get healthy again? Ah, it's a sick, sick world, my friend. It is. (laughs) It's a sick, sick world, and also just to like. For those of us, those of you listening, I, 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 I was talking, I did a, I wrote up a little thing the other day because I couldn't stop thinking about the fixation of like comparing yourself to then versus now. Mm-hmm. And a big part was body image. And mm-hmm. I went kind of like went into that a bit deeper. Um, but just to give all of us some compassion to our own relationship with our body, we've grown up in one of the most toxic times, especially us millennials, I, I think. I want to like circle us out we've grown up in one of the most toxic times in terms of women's bodies full stop like the whole body positivity body neutrality oh i wish this was a thing when we were growing up because we grew up around tabloid culture around hidden tumblr groups (laughs) and like the scars even if they're they're on everybody we all have scars i have never met a woman who has fully loved her body without having to do the hard, uncomfortable work to get there. Like we just, we're all, ugh, I hate this word, but tainted by that environment we grew up in. Yeah, we were yeah. told that our confidence had to, like we had to fight to deserve it. Mm-hmm. We couldn't just have it. Yeah. And I agree that like, I think we kind of came in the cusp, like we came right at the end of its peak toxicity mm-hmm. as the conversation started to take place so that now, I mean, it's the number one, mental health killer 
in the world. Like it's the number one deadliest mental health disorder. Eat, eating disorders. Eating disorders. Okay, wait. But since we're on that topic, wait, wait. Because you brought up an acronym I didn't know earlier. What was it? Uh, EDNOS. E D N O S. E D N O S. So what is EDNOS? So. When we talk about eating disorders, typically we're talking about anorexia nervosa and we're talking about bulimia nervosa. But EDNOS is eating disorders not otherwise specified. Mm. So manifesting a lot of disordered eating patterns that don't strictly fall under the categories of perfectly starving yourself or the binge purge cycle that we come to know as bulimia. Mm -hmm. And I think the vast majority of sufferers fall under EDNOS. Um, I know I did because I never got clinical confirmation mm. but it didn't take clinical confirmation to see how bad it was getting and then you know we've come up with other terms like orthorexia which mm -hmm. is a, like a fixation with healthy foods but it's all otherwise eating disorders or disordered eating by new names like yeah even clean eating like uh, orthorexia orthorexia clean yeah. eating there's like a i mean it's now being torn down but just five years ago Less, three yeah. years it ago. It was the Vogue eating yeah, disorder to have. Exactly. So will the cycle ever end? <laughs> <laughs> we'll let you know in 20 years, kids. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so let's come back to your story. Um, mentally after, let's bring it back to the mashed potato because mm. that was your point where you were like, oh shit. Yeah, I was like, fuck. Yeah, I gotta this is do bad. something. What was the something? I needed to change what my body was to me. Mm -hmm. My body was something to be punished. It was something that needed to be controlled. And I needed to understand it for what it was giving me rather than what I could take away from it. Mm -hmm. And so a few things happened and I I think I credit most of my recovery up to this and it did take a few years, but I think it was absolutely instrumental is my dad focused in, like he zoomed in on my passion for food. He knew that I never stopped loving food. So he would say, you pick whatever restaurant you want to eat at. It doesn't matter how casual or fancy we will go. And so I oh, would just I love that. I would pick yeah. my dream restaurants Ooh. like Michelin starred everything like I mean we didn't spend an outrageous amount of money we would go for the lunch menus that's a little life hack it's set, way cheaper at menus. lunch yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the prefix it's yeah. great um and we would sit and we would just enjoy the meal together and like love the food for what it was and if my brain started to tick, he'd be like, you know what? You can work out later. You can do that later. But right now we're here. We're eating this meal. Mm. And so I, would, so I would just, I fell in love with food again. Like I fell in love with eating food again. When before it was just this like anxiety inducing exercise. And I never stopped loving it, but I stopped trying to let myself enjoy it. Mm. That was the thing. So back, so before that point, when you would enjoy a meal, you'd feel guilty. Always. I would mm. feel guilty the moment I put my fork down mm -hmm. and I would think, when can I run again? Mm -hmm. Like, when can I, when can I burn this off? Yeah. When can I yeah, make up for this? Yeah, exactly. Um, and then the other thing that happened, which I still do to this day. And I think is the thing that when I say I'm still in recovery is the thing that keeps me on track is I started strength training mm -hmm. because my way of dealing with what I considered to be overeating was I would run and I would run so far and so fast that my, 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 I was genuinely a machine. I can't run as fast as I ran for as long as I did. I would run 10 kilometers in like 45 minutes. I was speedy. Damn. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's really crazy i was just like yeah. i was just on a mission my brain would completely zone out i would just go wow. and i would kill it and like and i would think look at how athletic i am look mm. how great i am and then my dad came over and he's like i want you to strength train so he signed me up with a personal trainer and then he'd be like yeah you can run that fast and that's great good for you he's like pick up that weight and i couldn't mm. do it and he's like right so your body is literally nothing so that the wind could blow you over so he's like we need for you to build your strength back. So then slowly but surely we got into like deadlifts and bench press and all the fun, heavy, really, like the really heavy stuff that I love today. And then what the trainer would say is tonight I need you to eat 
a lot more than you're comfortable eating and I need them to be carbohydrates which I know you don't eat enough of and uh, and then he said because you're going to lift heavy tomorrow and if you can't do it I'll know why Mm. and I would try I would genuinely sit there and see the extra slice of bread or the extra scoop of rice and be and I would put it on my plate and I would be there like no I'm going to show him that I can do it without the fuel I'm going to show him that I can still compete. And could you? I could still perform. No. So I would try to pick up this weight. Sports science. (laughs) Genuinely. (laughs) Yeah. You need your energy. Yeah. Yeah. I would turn up. I would try to pick up the weight. I would get about like half, like a half inch off the ground and drop it. And then he would just look at me and be like, I don't need to say anything because you know what this is. Mm. And he, what he did that I don't think he realized he did consciously was cater to that overperforming self like that overachieving self but twisting it back on me Mm. and being like if you want to excel at this you're gonna have to do the thing that you hate because what's worth more to you now and I needed to prove that I could do it so classic Marissa (laughs) (laughs) exactly it was like this inner competitive girl yeah okay so I then because I'm trying to find within this what your why was right like was it I guess, well, I guess your why was always there. You wanted to get healthy. You just couldn't because of your disorder. So now that you could, was it stronger? Was it fueling you stronger? Yeah, it was kind of like this. It was like a positive feedback loop of seeing what I was physically capable of and then realizing what it was going to take to achieve more and then going back and then trying to weigh up what was worth more to me yeah and at the same time as is life like you meet new people people are asking you out on dates and Mm -hmm. I was going on dates and not being able to like I didn't have energy for dates I didn't want to eat on dates I didn't drink at the time like what was I bringing to the table I was going to drink a black coffee and try like Mm. show who I was no I was Mm. like it didn't add up so then I think it got to the point where the gym helped, the food, like rebuilding my relationship with food helped. Understanding what I wanted to do in a career sense started to help because I wanted to be a food writer. I was so passionate about food. Mm. I wanted to tell people where to go to eat. Like I loved it so much. Um, There was a time I wanted to go to culinary school. I taught myself how to cook because I enjoyed it so much. Um, Because also it wasn't just eating it wasn't just food the meaning behind this was your recovery it was your healing yeah yeah but not consciously no yeah Yeah. no i'm the reason i'm pointing it out like that now is because i was i know someone who's also going through a healing and they they've gone through um a long time of bodily harm Mm. and through nutrition and cooking it is more than them just learning how to cook. It's more than them, than them just enjoying a good meal. It is their way of gaining the trust they have with themselves back. It is like the reversal of I've damaged my body, you, my body, for all these years. This is my time to heal us and to show you, my body, that I do love you and you can trust me again. So it was like, it was so much bigger than just sitting down and eating. It it's was a so sign true. to yourself that I love you. It was yeah. true. It is true. Because when I taught myself how to cook, my thing was, I'm going to learn about nutrition and I'm going to understand what my body actually needs now. Mm-hmm. So I was going to, I ate so many vegetables. Like I learned about different vitamins, minerals, like why iron was so fundamental to my diet, like why fish was a good option. Like just learning basic nutrition that I still carry with me today. Like why protein is so critical to recovery and all that mm-hmm. sort of stuff. Why carbohydrates are not the devil's work. They're actually absolutely fundamental to the functioning the of the brain. They're the angel's gifts, guys. Have you tried cheesy mash? Like, do it's, you know mac and cheese? Yeah, the genuinely yeah. understanding. It, this sounds so silly, but like eating just a loaf of bread or something like a fresh baguette, the mood effect that that would have, like how much happier I would be just by eating bread, just by having sugar in mm. my body. I was like, no, that can't be right. Like mm. that's that just doesn't add up. Of course it did. Because my body was like, oh my God, energy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah. So, okay. Um, you are now 30. Yeah. 
four-ish years of this high of rediscovering yourself, your body, your what the relationship you have with food and nutrition, your mind is healing, your spirit is healing. Does your eating disorder still come up? And when does it and what does it look like? Um, it does in different ways. The biggest one is if I'm having a low day and I'm just, my self-esteem isn't where it, it should normally be, I will, or I'll see a photo of my past self. Mm -hmm. There will be a bit of me that says, you looked better then. Mm -hmm. And this little toxic, fucked up little voice will say, you know what it could, like, you know you could get there again because you know what it takes. You've done it before. You've done it before. Yeah. You can do it again. Um, but then I think because I'm, I'm older and I've kind of gotten a bit of distance from it, the other voice is a lot louder now and it says, yeah, but imagine and remember what you have to throw away in order to achieve that again. Yeah. And like all the relationships that I have now that means so much to me, the career that I have, the energy I have to keep going to the gym and like yeah. love doing what I'm doing. Some would call that voice your higher self. Yeah. Yeah. We like her. We she's, do. She's great. She looks after yeah. you. Yeah. And then um, it's also really bad if, if my anxiety peaks. And I don't just mean in terms of like, oh, I'm having an anxious day. I mean when it really hits a high. I'll see or I'll notice that I change how I eat. Mm. And so I, how? How would it change? I just stop. And it's not because like I'm trying to, I'm, it's not because I'm kind of regressing into this mindset of try get skinny, try minimize mm. yourself. It's just... I look at food and think that's not of value to you. Mm. And I just, and I, and my, and I'll just have long stretches. So I'll have to actively sit. And this is the tricky part is that that will come up. And if I notice it in time, then I will just sit and I will cook myself a meal mm. and I will force myself to sit down and eat it no matter how much I hate it. Cause that will just keep me on track. Mm. So it's high yourself. Yeah. High yourself. It's yeah. very much this separate stream of information saying, nope. Catch mm. it now because you're going to fuck yourself up if you keep going down this route. And yeah, it, it, it pops up every now and again. Like I, I love the idea of body neutrality, but it's not a perfect system. It never is. There are days where I don't like my body. Like yeah. that's the same with everybody. Yeah. But it's only the level to which you really let it affect how you operate in the world. And I will say I am the heaviest I have ever been in my life. And I think I have more esteem now than I did at my lowest weight when I was celebrated the most for all it. All that weight, all that is personality. <laughs> <laughs> we got a lot of it. <laughs> That's crazy. That's amazing, though. I remember when you showed me the photo mm. of yourself um, when you had just started your strength training. Yeah. It was bad. I still couldn't get over it because it was actually putting an image to this chapter of your life that I'd only hear about yeah but after I saw you like I actually saw that state that your body was in so many things about you just clicked into place I can't even explain it like so many details about how you are and why you are the way you are just suddenly made sense like what I don't know I think it's like well firstly your anxiety was explained mm-hmm because then I realized, okay, she's not playing. <laughs> she's not. Well, <laughs> Bitch ain't playing. She's not. Because it can go to a certain degree. Yeah. And she's been there. Yeah. And now I know why, like, the gym is not just the gym to you. Mm hmm You know? And now I know that when you, like, eat food, you're not just, like, it's not just, like, a mindless thing. You're actually, like, eating it because you like it. It's, 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 it, it shifts. Um, but also other things about you, like the control element, which you still have. Yeah, you I do. do. It just comes out the in social, other ways. The socialness about you and how you, we always say, and also on the podcast, you're always like, you're having a bit of like a late in life blooming. Mm -hmm. This is, a, I mean, I knew that, but like now I really understand it. Like how in the last two years you've made more friends than you've made your entire life. <laughs> You're so much more social. Why putting yourself out there is such a big deal to you. Yeah. You know? And like, yeah. we're in our 30s now, 31, 29, 30 almost, whatever. No, Round no, up, no, dude. No, Round up. 30, 30 this year. 
<laughs> and I think a lot of our peers had experienced what you're going through now at an earlier age. Like I know I did, mm. right? So like now I really understand when you are excited for something. It's like, it's not just, that. it's not just you. It's like your inner kid is excited for it. It's so pure, actually. It's fucking adorable. <laughs> <laughs> when Marissa's like, ah, God, you know, we're going on a date. Like this big sister in me is like, you go girl. <laughs> go get that it's, date it's true yeah. I because I, also I also want to re- like highlight to people that in those years when you were going through the uh, the climax of your eating disorder it robbed you of a lot of social elements it, it rob- did. yeah because I remember you were telling me that you wouldn't go out because because like going because food is such like a, a pivotal social element people are always going for dinners for drinks pre-drinks snacks picnics lunches brunches your eating disorder kept you from going out because you would feel anxious at having to eat around people because it made you self-conscious yeah it was more it was also just everyone knew me for the girl who was struggling Mm -hmm. but wouldn't talk about it Mm -hmm. played off like it was nothing so what did I have to add to that situation? Yeah. But I will say that like there were a few people, there were a few key friendships in that time that treated, that saw me as just a person and didn't treat me as this person that needed help. Like they were, they never stopped making fun of me. They would keep asking me out even if they knew 90% of the time I wasn't going to go. And like those are still my best friends today because mm. they're the only ones that just made me feel like I was normal mm. when I was the least from normal that I could have been. Mm. But yeah, I mean, I do get excited about all those things now. And I do know I'm a late bloomer and it did rob me of so much. But at the same time, I think in this really twisted way, it's given me a lot of the confidence I have now. Oh, for sure. Because it's like, you know how far you climb to be to where 100%. you are. percent. And there is nothing more valuable than lived experiences. So when people talk about self-esteem or you know body image like feeling up and down whatever like where you come from is a place of deep knowledge Mm. because you had lived through the whole volume (laughs) of this series (laughs) so you 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 know it comes from a much more grounded place of knowing yeah um i mean in many ways i wish i could have learned those things without the suffering Mm. but I will say that I think it did shape who I am in so many ways. For sure. And also you on this podcast right now, like you sharing this story, I want you to also consider like the freeing element of it because there's a lot of people who know you who don't know this about you. I think that's why it took me a long time to actually say, I think I'm finally ready to record this one because this is a story I don't tell people. When people ask, I'll explain it, but... The depth of it. I don't like the idea of people knowing me for this. Mm -hmm. So I think it took a long time to get to a stage where people could know me for so many other things that I'm bringing to the table before they understand where it comes from. It's also like a surprise. Guess what I went through? (laughs) Yeah, I think I lived through shit. Everyone always like jokes around like, oh, you always seem to like have it all together or like you know, trying to, you're so driven in your career and your fitness and blah, blah, blah. And it's true. Like I, I do take pride in all those things, but it's just like, I, it's scary to me that people are going to see where the breaks in the chain were to actually come to this point. But, um, I mean, the last episode we talked about taking back your power. I firmly believe that what you are doing now to share this is like, tenfold of what we were giggling about in the last episode (laughs) making out with a boy (laughs) slightly different yeah slightly different because i mean i deeply believe in the power of sharing yeah so i don't know guys i mean here we go yeah this other side of your bestie that you've been tuning into (sighs) if you have for the last two years i wasn't damaged enough how about now (laughs) There we go with the dark humor. <laughs> there she is. Um, I'm really proud of you. Thank you. I'm really, Thank really you. proud of you. I think, I mean, I think at the end of this, like all I, I think the question is always like, what do you wish other people going through this would want to know, mm-hmm. right? Or would, would I want to tell them? Or what I wish I heard when I was going through this. And I think 
the main thing is that people are always going to misunderstand what you're going through. Your physical recovery is not your mental recovery. Those are two separate journeys that are connected, but one's going to take a lot longer. And also that it is going to be the hardest thing you're ever going to do. And you're going to hate a lot of it. And even though things are for your own good, everything in your body, like every instinct you have is going to tell you to go the other way. So nothing you are about to do is going to make sense, but you're going to just have to push if you genuinely want to get yourself out of this. And the outcome is worth it. But I think we're told that, but we already knew it, Mm. but we just didn't know how to like make that jump. Mm. And so accept the help as well don't think this is supposed to this is something you're supposed to figure out on your own even if people don't understand it when people misunderstand you as they will i know you're going to be low blood sugar so you're probably going to be snappy about it but try be patient (laughs) i knew i fought people over it and just it's gonna take a long time but pace yourself and it will work itself out so long as you're working on it Mm. It's about like one sliver of what I wish I could tell my younger self. Mm. But I feel like it's a start point. Mm. Mm. (laughs) Sending it on that lovely, warm feeling of you did a good thing. (laughs) (laughs) You just did a good thing. Your Uh, higher self is in the background going. Just fighting every "Mm." instinct to just like make some kind of twisted joke. (laughs) And laugh through this suffering again. <laughs> no, no, we're just gonna sit here with the. Hmm. Should have worn the egg T-shirt today. There it goes. There it goes. <laughs> <laughs> this is my armor. <laughs> Another thing that they don't tell you about getting to a healthy weight: boobs. Oh yes. Great addition. Yeah. Love them. Ass. Ass. Yeah. Great addition. Something to twerk with. <laughs> Something to twerk yeah. with. Yeah. All those things that I. I mean, I'm not going to lie, even at like my lowest, I genuinely believed that I had an ass. And my mom was like, check Child, yourself. What is this? Like, I was like weirdly <laughs> cocky about the weirdest things, thinking yeah. I had an ass. And my like double A bra, and like, there was no shape. <laughs> I think it's so interesting as well when we talk about mental illness, because it's like, man, you really, like, we really need to take a second to... Uh, acknowledge our privilege to be able to have this like I guess quote unquote normal view of how we go out into the world Mm -hmm. you know like I know people who have struggled with addiction I know people who are like highly anxious who are extreme introverts um, people who have hypochondria who are scared of germs and just just the thought of them entering the world the way that we do so casually is a battle And it just, yeah, what I'm taking away from hearing your experience is while I'm very proud of you and your big sister is like, yes, girl, (laughs) I'm also saying like, wow, like, you know, check ourselves. Exactly. Yeah. Like it is a privilege to live life the way that we can. Yeah. There will genuinely be a moment. Like there are times now where I'll eat a bowl of mashed potato and think back to that day and think, I used to cry over this. Mm. And now I want a second helping. Ooh, and get even a third. Though, like even though I'll sit there thinking, oh shit, I think I overate today. My brain being like, yeah, but you, you know, you can run it off tomorrow. Like it is gonna work itself out. It'll balance itself out. Previously, that would have been the end of the world. Mm. I, I mean, and now I'm just like, that's the end of this belt loop. Like, <laughs> <laughs> like I'm not trying to like add on my like body image things to this because I don't want to bring it into this arena. But like even small things, like you know, back then when we're when we'd eat a full meal and we'd be like, oh my god, the bloat. Yeah. Honestly, these days I'm like four months pregnant what do you think i can get a seat on the mrt like well will someone stand up for me because this is impressive like our bodies are insane yeah it's so true but it's just it's a it's a funny thing to be like i don't know your jeans fit tighter after a holiday you're like oh yeah it was a great time yeah and just thinking like your body will find its natural balance again so long as you stick to your usual habits keep it healthy keep it clean yeah. It'll work itself out, but you don't need that control. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, the adventures of uh, both of us learning to let go of control will continue. It will re- be reported on this podcast. Um, and we hope that your 
hearts were touched by Marissa's story. Why do I sound so freaky when I say touched? You know oh, what I mean? It's, it's because like none gooey. of us, are, we're never ooey gooey. And then so when you, like, I'm quite I'm so up. proud of you. I hated that. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I get it, and I'm glad. But like, even Stop. when you touched me, I was like, oh. I felt it. I felt the tense. <laughs> I, was like, oh. I, was like, I don't care. She needs touch. <laughs> no, I appreciated it. Okay. <laughs> but like, when we talk about it later, we're never gonna. We're not gonna do that for a while. <laughs> we're gonna do it all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Broke a barrier. <laughs> all right, guys. Have a gorgeous rest of your day. Reach out as always. You know we love it when you yeah. do. Marissa, any final words before we close off? If you're struggling. Or if you think you might be struggling but haven't really figured that part out yet, or you have a friend, message me. Genuinely message me. Um, I want to help as much as I can. That's about it. Uh, <laughs> Your nips? I'm not gonna say. I'm not gonna say it. I got goosebumps and it went up to my chest. Okay. I made your nips hard with my kindness. Okay, bye guys. <laughs> <laughs>